start. Uh, the first speaker this afternoon is uh, Yi Sun, and he will talk about algebraic structures for multi-level eigenvalue densities. All right, thanks. Um, first, I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation to speak here. So as Guillaume mentioned, the title of my talk is Algebraic Structures for Multi-Level Eigenvalue Densities. And so I'll be talking about some algebra which underlies the multi-level structure of eigenvalue densities. Okay, so that was the restatement of my title. So let's talk about uh, specifically what type of densities I want to consider. So first, the first uh, random matrix ensemble I want to talk about is the generalized beta Wishart ensemble. So to construct this, first I'll fix some n, and I'll take two sets of parameters, pi and pi hat. And then I'll create a large uh, rectangular random matrix whose entries are Gaussian with covariance which depends on these parameters. So as you can see, the ij entry has covariance which depends on pi j and pi i hat. And I want it to be Gaussian, but uh, either real if beta equals one, or complex if beta equals two. And let me take x sub m to be the first m rows of this matrix. And so the eigenvalues I want to consider is the joint distribution of the uh, squared singular values of x sub m. So I'll call that lambda m. Now, if I consider just a single level, then this corresponds to a spike covariance model with spikes theta 1 through theta k, if I specialize the parameters so that all the pi hats are just 0, and all the pi's are the inverses of theta and then 1's. So this is a model that shows up in statistics. And alternatively, if I specialize all the pi's to 0 and all the pi hats to 1, then I just get the standard Wishart ensemble. And so that means that the single level density is this standard uh, Wishart density. Okay. Now, a second type of model that I'll be considering is the beta Jacobi model. So to construct that, I'll take two matrices, which are large and rectangular, and whose each, uh, where each entry is going to be an IID Gaussian. Again, it's going to be real if beta equals 1, and complex if beta equals 2. And again, I'll take various slices of these matrices. So I'll pick a number A, which is greater than N, and I'll take the first A rows of X, and I'll pick a number M, which will vary from 1 to N. I'll take the first M rows of Y. And then I'll construct uh, this, this matrix here, X star X times X star X plus Y star Y inverse. And this matrix, you can, uh, you can see from the constraints on the sizes that it almost surely has M eigenvalues between 0 and 1. And what I want to study is the multilevel structure of the joint distribution of these eigenvalues as m varies between 1 and n. So this type of construction appears in statistics in the study of MANOVA models. And its single level density is, again, one of the three classical random matrix ensembles. So I have the Vandermont, and then I have a weight corresponding to the Jacobi uh, orthogonal polynomials, for example. OK, so I said I want to consider the multilevel structure. So what does that mean? It means I want to understand how the eigenvalues vary as I change the level. So that's course going to correspond to this parameter m that I specified. And the basic fact is that the eigenvalues at adjacent levels interlace. So what that means is that they satisfy this system of inequalities. But, or you can see that the eigenvalues at level 3, well, they lie between the eigenvalues at level 4, and also they lie between the eigenvalues at level 2. So that's what I mean by interlacing. Now, what's more, if I just consider the uh, beta Wishart ensemble with parameters, the standard parameters, pi equals 0 and pi equals 1, then in fact I can consider this picture as some Markov process when I go up in level or down in level. In fact, the transition densities of this process are known explicitly. So another way to say it is that the uh, multilevel density has a beta Gibbs property. So when beta equals 2, this means that if I fix the distribution at the top level, then uh, conditioned on that, the, dis the distribution of the lower levels is simply uniform uh, subject to the constraints imposed by interlacing. So that means it's uniform on some polytope, which is called the Galfan-Salem polytope. Now at beta equals 1, there's a similar description, except now the measure is not uniform. It's some beta deformation of the uniform measure. OK, so this is some, some structural properties of a multilevel matrix ensemble. 
And for the first half of the talk, I'm going to talk about how to relate these properties in the more general settings that I introduced earlier to certain branching properties of uh, algebraic functions. And so these will be functions which are defined at general beta, and they provide some algebraic interpolation of this structure uh, to all betas. And these functions will come from the study of McDonald polynomials, and they're called uh, multivariate Bessel and Heckman optim functions. And in the second half of the talk, I'll introduce some dynamical model whose fixed time distributions will actually produce this multi-level structure in the beta equals two case. Okay, so let's, let's do uh, goal one. And so for this, I need to introduce these special functions, the multivariate Bessel and Heckman optimum functions, which come, roughly speaking, from representation theory. Okay, so what's a multivariate Bessel function? And a most, the most straightforward definition, I think, is it's simply a certain integral. So here's an integral formula for the function. Um, in all the formulas, uh, a more convenient parameterization is to use theta equals beta over two, but theta and beta are just related by this constant factor. The multivariate Bessel function is a function of two arguments, lambda and s, which will be strings of length n. So they'll be ve vectors of length n. And one way to define it is as a certain explicit integral. So the domain of integration here is the Galfon-Selen polytope. That means I have a chain of lambda 1 through lambda n, where lambda i is a vector of length i, and every pair of adjacent lambdas should interlace. So this is an explicit you know, finite polytope. And the integrand has an exponential weight here, and then some sort of term which involves adjacent levels. So of course, this is not the original definition of these functions. They originally came from the study of certain integrable systems in representation theory, so you can define them using the, as eigenfunctions of the rational closure Moser system. And so they're studied by many authors. Uh, one thing I want to point out is Okunkov and Olshansky actually showed that they were a certain scaling limit of the Jack polynomials, if you know what those are. Now, the form that I've shown here, this integral, was first studied by Gurr and Kohler. And in what follows, I'll need to use uh, some reweighting of the Bessel function, which, is, which I'll call the conjugate Bessel function. Okay. So the properties that I care about for these multivariate Bessel functions is first, they have a branching structure. So what that means is that if I want to consider this uh, function as a function of the s variables, and which is indexed by the lambda variables, then in fact, I can view it as a function of just the first of the last s, Sn, and ask somehow, can I represent it as an integral over a function of the other s's? And in fact, it shows that in I should just integrate over a smaller multivariate Bessel function with this exponential weight and then this branching factor. And the key point is that this branching factor depends only on uh, this lambda which interlaces, or this mu which interlaces with lambda. Okay, so if you've seen branching of Schur functions or, or Jack functions, this is actually just a scaling limit of the Jack branching. Now, the second point is that actually these multivariate Bessel functions can be rel related to certain orbital integrals. And this is where the relation to random matrix theory will come in. So at beta equals two, it's well known that actually it's simply the, uh, the multivariate Bessel function and the HCIZ integral are the same thing. And the outcome is some determinal, has a determinal form. And this allows you to relate this beta equals two multivariate Bessel function to some reparameterization of a Schur function. Now, at beta equals one, it's not true that the multivariate Bessel function has some explicit form like this. However, it's possible to represent it as an orbital integral over the orthogonal group. And that takes a form that's essentially identical to the HCIC integral. And so this, these, result, these, are, these follow from some results of Nareen. Sorry, so that uh, beta equals one integral lambda and s is still thinking in diagonal? Oh, yeah, sorry. So in, in these two integrals, lambda and s a priori are vectors of like n. So here, when I take the trace, I take uh, lambda and s to be the diagonal matrices whose entries are those vectors. Question, uh, beta equals s equals I presume you can create something similar, but I haven't looked into it. OK, so the first result on these eigenvalues is actually that the generalized beta wishing ensemble with certain parameters is exactly a measure which can be expressed in terms of the branching structure of the multivariate Bessel functions. 
So I'll call that a multivariate Bessel measure in analogy with the Sure measure. So what that means is that a single level density is simply the product of two multivariate Bessel functions in addition to some weight. Uh, that's the first thing. And the second is that actually the level to level branching of this measure is given simply by the branching of the multivariate Bessel function. So if I want the joint density of the uh, multivariate ensemble, then what I should do is open up the integral formula for this first multivariate Bessel function. And what I get is what I get. And so for beta equals two, this is simply a result about Schur measures. And this was conjectured uh, by Borden and Pesce a while ago and proven by these authors. So I don't want to dwell too long on the proof, but essentially what it does is compare uh, to this standard setting and then use the fact that multivariate Bessel functions are related to these orbital integrals. So in some sense, what this theorem is saying is that the branching structure or the restriction structure of multilevel eigenvalues coincides with the branching structure of these multivariate Bessel functions. And you might expect that because of the relation to orbital integrals. OK. Now, now I want to talk about the Jacobi setting. And for that, I need to introduce what's called the heckman optum hypergeometric functions. And you should think of these somehow as the trigonometric analog of the multivariate Bessel functions. So again, they have, I've given a very explicit definition just to be concise. So it's somehow you take the expression for the multivariate Bessel function and change every term to its trigonometric analog. So I replace the van der Mond by the trigonometric van der Mond. And here, I do the same thing. And again, there's this exponential weight in an integra integral over Galfon, the galfon selin polytope. And now these functions were also studied in representation theory, and they come roughly from the trigonometric Clodro-Moser system. And thus, this specific integral formula was uh, discovered by Bordian and Gorin in their study of uh, limits of the McDonald branching rule. And you can also prove this via quantum groups. OK, so these second optimum functions have pretty similar structure to multivariate Bessel functions. So I want to emphasize three things. First, there is a similar branching structure. So this formula expresses a larger Heckman optimum function as an integral over smaller ones with a specific exponential factor and then a branching factor, which only depends on the indices. Now, something which is a little different is that there's a principal specialization. What that means is if I take the argument S to be a specific arithmetic progression whose difference depends on theta, then these functions sort of collapse and have a very special form. And finally, this is formalizes what I said earlier. There's just some limit between the, the heckman optimum functions and the multivariate Bessel functions. OK, so the result in this setting is actually that the branching structure of the beta Jacobi ensemble corresponds to the branching structure of a principally specialized heckman optimum measure. So what that means is I pick the special parameters uh, here, then actually the single level density of the multilevel beta Jacobi ensemble is just given by a product of Heckman optimum functions with certain weight. And again, the multilevel structure is just given by the branching. I open up the integral of the first uh, Heckman optimum function. Okay, so in this case, because I don't have parameters in my uh, beta Jacobi ensemble, actually I'm forced to choose the correct choice is these principal specializations for the Heckman optimum functions. And so this was a conjecture, conjectured by Bordy and Gorin, and they allow us to link some of their work on these Heckman optimum measures to an interpretation for random matrix ensembles. So what they did is they studied the asymptotics of these measures using techniques from McDonald processes, and they showed certain Gaussian free field fluctuations. So this actually is able to translate that work to the random matrix results. OK, and I want to talk very briefly about the proof of, of this statement. So for, for multivariate Bessel functions, one might expect that they're related to random matrices because of this relation to orbital integrals. But for Heckman optimum functions, it's a bit less clear. And so, and I actually, I, I find this proof a bit mysterious. So the way it goes is that first, you, remember, you're considering the eigenvalues of this matrix. So what I do is I first condition on the eigenvalues of x because somehow the branching is independent of that. So if I make this conditioning, then it turns out the resulting eigenvalue distribution 
is somehow algebraically related to a multi-level multi beta Wisher distribution with certain parameters depending on the eigenvalues of x. So I should pick pi equals lambda, the eigenvalues of x, and pi hat equals zero. Now, we earlier showed that actually the level-to-level -level transitions of that process are Markov with some explicit transitions. That, was, that involves somehow multivariate Bessel functions. And so now, the level-to-level -level transitions of the eigenvalues of this matrix, well, if I condition on the eigenvalues of x star x, they're Markov with some transitions. So the resulting process is some mixture of Markov processes. And if you compute, you can actually show that they remain Markov and they have the required transitions. I don't really have a very good conceptual explanation for why that's the case, but somehow you can translate the relation between multivariate Bessels and random matrices to this relation between principally specialized Heckman optimums and random matrices. And I want to say it might be natural to try to add some parameters to the Heckman optimums. Of course, the Heckman optimum functions admitted parameters as well. But I think I tried for a bit, and I don't think that actually corresponds to any random matrix ensemble I can create. OK, so somehow that, this part of the talk gave some relation between these two families of special functions and certain families of random matrices. OK, so in the, in the remainder of the talk, I want to talk about a dynamical way of realizing these models. And this will, relate, this will apply in the case that beta equals 2 ohm, so only in the complex case. OK, and so what I'll do is I'll create a particle system which has local interactions such that the fixed time marginals are going to correspond to these multi-level eigenvalue processes that I've defined. And to do that, I'll, I want to talk about the dynamics, a dynamical model for uh, these eigenvalues at a single level. So th this will be a generalization of Dyson Brownian motion. So just to fix notations, if I take a Brownian motion in the space of n by n Hermitian matrices, then Dyson Brownian motion is just the resulting process on the eigenvalues of that system. And it solves the following SDE, where I have a Brownian driving term and then some strong repulsion given by this term. And I want to say that you can view this as a dube H transform of a system of n independent Brownian motions. OK, and so in the, in the Wigner case, another thing I, an analog of the Wishart and Jacobi ensembles is what's called the Dewey corners ensemble. So that corresponds to the joint law of the eigenvalues of k by k principal submatrices. So previously, we had the squared singular values of successive uh, slices of a rectangular matrix. Here, the correct analog is eigenvalues of principal submatrices. And again, these have domain in a like, certain Gelfand Selin polytope, which enforces some interlacing condition. And secondly, they have a Gibbs measure. That means if I fix this top row, then the distribution of the ones below is uniform subject to these uh, Gibbs constraints. OK, so in the mid-2000s, John Warren constructed a process such that the single level dynamics will be Dyson Brownian motion, and the fixed time marginals will be the GUE's corners process. Now, so here's how you construct that process. First, you take this stochastic differential equation with reflection. So I, I have a triangular array of particles. The particle at level k and index i will have a Brownian motion driving term. And then I'll have two local time terms which enforce reflection off the particles below it. So if I look at this particle on level 5, then it will evolve freely with a Brownian motion except that it reflects off the two Brownian motions below. OK, so Warren is able to actually prove first that this system of stochastic differential equations emits a solution. And so there's a unique weak solution when you have a Gibbs initial condition. And in particular, you can start it from 0 with this explicit entrance law. In this case, he is able to do this by just transforming and a deterministic array of Brownian motions through a determinist, uh, an array of Brownian motions through a deterministic score hot mapping. And as I said earlier, he's able to show that if I project to a single level, 
then the, the, uh, the process actually evolves Markovian in a Markov way, and it coincides with dyson brownian motion. This might be a bit surprising. You have a triangular rate of particles that are all interacting, but somehow you can, you can cover up the bottom layer and still get something Markovian. And he also showed that the, this process preserves Gibbs measures. And in particular, it means that the fixed time distribution of the eigenvalues is just the GUE corners process. Now, you might be tempted to think that this means that this process just corresponds to taking a uh, Brownian motion in the space of complex Hermitian matrices and at each time looking at its distribution of principal eigenvalues. Right? Because that's also something which might ha which would have these two properties. But in fact, um, it does not coincide. And it was shown by Adler, Nordenstam, and Van Marbeke that if you look at that process and you look at the, if you project to a two adjacent levels, that still evolves in a Markovian way. But in fact, if you project to three adjacent levels, it does not evolve in a, in a Markovian way. And in particular, when you take all levels, it's not Markovian. So somehow, this process is a little different. OK, so since Warren's work, there's been a, a number of, there's been a lot of work in this area, and the, there have been a lot of generalizations. So in the Brownian setting, there, there's work of several authors. It's been generalized to general beta by Goran and Shkolnikov. And of course, there's a lot of work on discrete models which exhibit this type of behavior. Now, there's essentially two types of proof for this type of statement. One, which is what Warren did, is that you can explicitly compute the semigroups and show there's some intertwining property. And the second, more recent approach uh, due to Gorin and Shkolnikov, or sorry, Paul and Shkolnikov, is to uh, take a sort of more differential approach and essentially work with the Markov generators and not look at the explicit formulas for semigroups. And so for the rest of the talk, I'll talk about how to generalize these results to processes which come from the Laguerre and Jacobi random matrix ensembles. In this case, I'll take the Paul and Skolnikov approach, but, but both steps are going to become more complicated. It's going to be more difficult to show existence, and also their approach will require some generalization. OK, so now let me talk about what the processes are. So first, I need a replacement of Dyson Brownian motion for the Wishart setting. And so here's how to construct it. Let me take a fixed matrix n by p of complex Brownian motions. And I want to look at the process of its squared singular values. So these, these are going to be in this order. And it was shown by Koenig and O'Connell that this process evolves in a Markovian way, and it solves the following stochastic differential equation. So here, I have a squared Bessel term, so 2 root L plus this driving term. And then again, I have a, uh, a strong repulsion term where I, I now have a linear numerator. And so it shouldn't be so surprising that squared Bessel processes occur, because if I set p equals 1, then x sub n just literally is a squared Bessel process. So one might expect that you should have squared Bessel process existing here. And similar to Dyson Brownian motion, this is simply a process of n independent squared Bessel processes, which are conditioned to never intersect via the Dube H transform. OK, in the static setting, what I want to get is, so here, this is uh, essentially a beta Wishart process, except that beta equals 2. So again, I have this interlacing property, and the eigenvalues have a Gibbs measure. So in this case, because I'm in the beta equals 2 setting, the uh, conditional distribution of the lower levels is uniform once I fix the top level. And so that's going to be an important property in what follows. OK, so the replacement, the generalization of Warren's process to this setting has the following uh, formula. So I take an SDE with reflection, where I take the same uh, squared Bessel driving terms as in the Laguerre eigenvalues process. I take the same driving term as in the single level process, and I'm going to replace the strong repulsion term with two local time terms, which enforce reflection off the particles at a lower level. And so here, again, the domain will be in a Gelfand Selen cone. OK, so pictorially, what this process is, is I start 
in blue, a squared Bessel process which evolves freely at level one. And then in black, I take two squared Bessel processes with a different dimension. So here, the dimension of the squared Bessel process is going to depend on the level that it, again evolve freely, except that they reflect off the level one pro particle. Now at level three, I'll take three squared Bessel processes, again with a shift in dimension, then interlace with and reflect off of the level two particles. And I'll keep going. Okay, so, so that's essentially what this uh, st stochastic differential equation with reflection is saying. Okay, so the result is that actually, if I start in any Gibbs initial condition, then I can get a unique strong solution to this stochastic differential equation. And its projection to any fixed level coincides in law with the Laguerre eigenvalues process. And that's the first point. The second point is that if I start with a Gibbs distribution and I run this evolution, then what I get is a Gibbs distribution. And finally, I can start it from zero with this explicit entrance law. And so what that shows actually is that the finite time distribution started with this entrance law is simply the, uh, the Laguerre corners process. Okay, so I want to point out one interesting point about this, which is if you project to the leftmost or rightmost particle on each level, then actually those evolve in a Markovian way, just alone. And if on the left edge, what you see is simply a sequence of squared Bessel processes, each of which sort of bumps into the squared Bessel process at a lower level. And so somehow this is a particle system with local interactions. Each particle only interacts with the particle below it. But the smallest eigenvalue should reproduce uh, the smallest eigenvalue of a P by P Wishart matrix. And this is some, somehow a very strongly coupled system from a system which has only local interactions. OK, so for the Jacobi setting, I want to talk about a different dynamical con construction for the Jacobi ensemble. So for this, I should the right thing to consider turns out to be uh, the following guy. Let me take a Brownian motion on the space of n by n unitary matrices. So a large Brownian motion on unitary matrices, and I'll cut out a rectangular corner, the top, top n by p corner, and consider its uh, squared singular values. So they're going to be somehow between 0 and 1. And it was shown by Dumeric that these evolve in the following way. I have a generator, uh, I have a process which has this term. The first three terms correspond to a uni univariate Jacobi process. So this is a certain one dimensional stochastic process that's related to the classical Jacobi polynomials. And then I have a strong repulsion term, which is similar to what we saw before, but with a quadratic term in the numerator. Now, the upshot is that the, the invariant measure of this diffusion is proportional to the, uh, the standard Jacobi ensemble from random matrices. So this is another construction of the Jacobi ensemble. Now, here's the analog of the Warren process in this setting. I'll take at each level, again, I'll take a triangular array of particles. At each level, I'll have the same Jacobi generator and then I'll have two local time terms, which will replace the strong repulsion. If I run the same story, what I get is that if I start from a Gibbs initial condition, which means the same thing as it did before, then when I project to um, any level, I'll recover the single level Jacobi eigenvalues process with these strong repulsion terms. Um, if I start with the Gibbs distribution, I will preserve that property. And finally, I can start with, the invariant, with an invariant measure, which is given by the Jacobi, like, like a Gibbs, Gibbs extension of the Jacobi random matrix uh, density. And so this shows that the fixed time distribution of this process still recovers this Jacobi corners process. OK, so for the rest of the talk, I want to talk about how to prove such statements. And essentially, there are two difficulties. First, in this setting, you have to somehow show that the stochastic differential equation with reflection has a solution. And second, you need to prove some properties of that solution. So let me first talk about first thing. So first, why is this you know, even challenging? Well, if I look at the stochastic differential equation with reflection for the Laguerre-Warren process, there's a couple features. First, 
this diffusion term is singular, meaning it's not Lipschitz. Um, second, the domain is the Galfonsel and cone. So that's some um, polyhedral cone, and in particular, it doesn't have a smooth boundary. And for certain reasons, if you study stochastic differential equations with reflection, this is not so good. And the last point is that the reflection off the boundary is oblique. So let me draw a picture to illustrate what that means. So let's imagine that there are sort of two particles with x and y coordinates. And I want to say that this is particle x, this is particle y. I want to say particle y moves freely, and particle x you know, might run into particle y and reflect off. Well, let's draw this in the xy plane. Particle x is going to, so x is going to be less than y. It's going to somehow go from here, collide with y, and then when it collides, it will reflect back. So as you can see, that's, that's not a standard reflection. It's not normal to the domain. And so that's called oblique reflection. OK, so somehow each of these things makes solving this type of SDE a bit more difficult. However, in this setting, we're able to sort of get around these difficulties by using the recursive structure of the definition. So we're going to reduce to the 1D setting, in which case there are some pretty powerful results. So what we'll do is we'll sort of go level by level, and it, we'll construct the particles at level k. And if you look at the structure of this, of this process, actually a particle level k only depends on the particles below it and around it. So that corresponds to the setting of a one-dimensional stochastic differential equation with reflection with time-dependent boundaries. So in general, I'll have some process dx with some diffusion and drift terms, and then some pushing terms, which enforce that it always stays between you know, a lower and upper boundary. And in this case, we have some pretty strong theorems which parallel the usual existence and uniqueness theorems for SDEs. So as long as I have uh, some Lipschitz, or some, some boundless conditions, Lipschitz on the drift, and then this uh, Yamada-Watanabe condition on the diffusion, then I have actually strong existence and uniqueness. And so this is exactly the condition which holds for this type of square vessel diffusion. So in fact, we're able to construct the process in a level-by-level -level fashion in a way which doesn't require the Gibbs initial condition at all. So we, if we just keep using the 1D criterion, what we need to do is show that we can't have triple collisions in this system. We can't have that two particles at the lower level sort of pinch around a particle at a higher level. And so this is ensured by some techniques uh, of Andre Sarantsev, who's studied you know, triple collisions for reflecting Brownian motions in great detail. And so we're actually able to show that for any initial conditions, there is a strong solution to these SDEs with reflection. And in particular, for Gibbs initial conditions. OK, 